Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter, verses 31 through 36. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So far our text. You may be seated. Dear Christian friends, Susie was at it again. She put her hand in the cookie jar. She knew it was wrong, so she backed away and put the lid on, went back to her room. But the cookies were calling to her. She was starving. It had been at least two hours since lunch, and she needed to eat. She knew that it was important to keep her strength up. She had heard that in school. And so, she went back to the kitchen. She took the lid off the cookie jar. And then her mom called her name. You see, Susie had been taking many cookies from the cookie jar. Probably two or three a day. And yet the cookies kept on being replenished, and so she didn't put two and two together, but her mom did. And so her mom called her on the carpet and said, Susie, have you been taking cookies? A lot of cookies. In the cookie jar? And Susie knew that it was time to tell the truth. That's where we're at today, my friends. It is time to tell the truth. It doesn't do any good to live a lie, does it? And even though the fear and dread that filled Susie's heart was crippling, she also knew that the freedom that would come from knowing that she didn't have to live a lie anymore. A lie of stealing cookies. Now, I give you that example because it's very benign, and yet I think all of you don't have to make too large of a jump in logic to see how this can be crippling, destructive, and ruin lives and relationships, futures. Living a lie can be devastating. And on this Reformation Sunday, we go forward under the, under the theme, it's time to tell the truth. The truth hurts sometimes, it does. And yet the truth sets us free every time. We jump into our text, and you see Jesus talking to Jews who had believed him. And it's kind of wide open. Did, this, did, did they all believe him? And there's not a lot that we can go on. You could, you could tell very, and we're going to go into some detail. Some of the Jews did believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Some weren't sure. People who aren't sure, we talked about it in our early Bible class this morning. What is an agnostic? Agnosko. Gnosko just means knowledge. It's a fancy Greek word. You put an A on the front, it means it's not there. They don't know. An agnostic doesn't know if there's a God or not. They're not so brazen as to say there's no God, but they're just not sure. And so these people who looked at Jesus, they weren't sure either. And so if you go on in our text, even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. That is to say, some believed him when he said he was the Savior of the world. But, some didn't. Not everybody liked what he had to say. So Jesus says in verse 31, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Beautiful word. Used by politicians alike. It just... We're only going to focus on the spiritual message today. With that ring of freedom, man, if you're an American, we love freedom. Well, some people bristled at this, and Jesus is reading hearts. And can you guess what the Jews said in verse 33? They answered, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? 
When I walk up to someone and I say, Jesus forgives your sins, what could be a reaction? You're, are you calling me a sinner? <laughs> eh, yeah. Some people don't want to hear that. And that's where they, where they were at. And the Jews had quite the history, didn't they? Who's that guy? That's David, Michelangelo, his masterpiece. Michelangelo chiseled that guy when he was only 24 years old. Amazing work. He was carved out of a piece of marble that they said was unusable, too, by the way. Fantastic. He's as tall as a two-story building. And yet, when you go into it, he is the model. The Jews, David is what they glass onto. They were a nation of kings, were they not? But isn't it weird to hang your hat before your God, to stand before your Lord and say, well, look at my ancestry. Look at my job. Look at the gifts that I have and my abilities. Look at my freedom. That's what the Jews did. Slaves, we were never slaves. And yet, you don't have to go into history too far. Can you think of a nation that may have enslaved the Jews? Ten plagues. Okay, it was Egypt. Yeah, and then there's the 70 years in Babylon, where they were carted off with hooks in their noses. Brutal. The temple was destroyed. Yeah, they were, they were slaves. And if you look at any picture of ancient Jerusalem, there's a giant building overlooking the temple. It was full of Romans. It was a garrison. There was a legion there in Jerusalem. The Jews were oppressed. And I don't need to get into the 20th century at all, do I? The Jews did not have a great history. There was all kinds of slavery. And so you could almost see Jesus roll his eyes. Really, guys? That's what you think? Abraham's descendants? So Jesus says, Very truly I tell you. And then your King James, it's verily, verily. In your NIV 84, it was, I tell you the truth. Amen, amen is the Greek. This is very important. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. I don't know if that's a picture of Susie or not. It's beside the point. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. This is not a new concept. And think about the gravity of Jesus' statement. He just condemned the whole race of humans. Right? Every one of us. If you go back five chapters in the Gospel of John, to John 3, he's talking to a Pharisee. Who knew the law backwards and forwards? His name was Nicodemus. He talked about the whole world being under this condemnation. How flesh gives birth to flesh. Adam in Genesis was made in the image of God, perfect in every way. Yet after the fall into sin, Adam's kid looked like him, acted like him, and sinned like him too. That's the sinful image that we have. We talked about it in the early Bible class. It's like ink on a robe that you can't get out. It's just part of the fabric. If you go back a few thousand years, there was a philosopher named Seneca. Show me anyone who is not a slave. One is a slave to lust, another to greed, a third to violence. All like to fear. He didn't live in America, and yet I think he understood slavery. Because, <clears throat> my fellow Americans, we are slaves to lust, to greed, to violence all like to fear. Now let's turn over the coin once, and I want to introduce you to that guy. It's Reformation Sunday, right? That's Martin Luther. And he was a troubled lawyer turned monk. He was a smart dude. Some people, I suppose you could call him a quitter if he was a lawyer and he just gave up his job, but he didn't give up that easily. He, he knew this statement, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. 
Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Martin Luther read those words, and for the first big chunk of his life, he was confused. He hated God. And that seems like a weird place to be, right? If you grew up in the church, in the Catholic church, and you followed all the rules, why would you hate God? Well, what does God think of sin? He hates sin. And yet one of the favorite phrases I hear from people is that our God hates sin but loves the sinner. My usual comeback to that is, does my God condemn sin to hell or sinners? And that's not a fun thought. What I'm trying to attach to you is culpability. There is responsibility that we have for our sin. Ownership of it. That's the truth. Susie could not chop off her hand and leave it in the cookie jar. It was hers. The crumbs don't lie. And yet the reality is, for Martin Luther, he just saw this, that my God hates sin. Yes, he even hates me. And you might argue and say, Pastor Fred, that's not true. And I know that. And yet if all you know is what your conscience tells you, what a few passages in Scripture of God's law that have beaten you down over the years, it is very possible that you hate God in return. Because how could you love him? If all he wants from you is perfection that you can't do. Luther tried to correct this by starving himself. By sleeping naked on a floor, maybe God will have mercy on me that way. What if I work my knuckles bare till I can see the bone literally? Will God love me then? What if I spend endless hours in confession and take notes of all the things that I've done wrong, every wicked thought that sneaks into my head, every lust, you name it. I'll write them all down, and then I will tell my confessor. That'll work, right? It didn't work. He was still a slave. How can you possibly say that we will be set free? It's impossible. The Jews refused to see themselves as slaves. They hung their hat on their history, their past, their pedigree. Luther, on the other side of the ditch, couldn't imagine how he could be free. Dear friends, it's time to tell the truth. How many of you know what those are? Those are not just giant goldfish. Those are koi. And <clears throat> there is a guy I knew back in Florida who had a koi pond in his backyard. And, uh, I mean, don't judge. Some people have birds. I have a dog. And he would go and he'd talk to them. They will eat out of your hand. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's fine. I'm not going to, it's okay. It's a pet. Well, um, he loved these fish. And I, I, I carry on conversations with, with my dog, and he kind of tilts his head at me. That means that he knows exactly what I'm saying. And I don't know if the fish turn their heads. I didn't do that much research on this, but um, yeah, so he had pet koi, whatever. So he goes out one day, and instead of coming up to him to get the bread, the fish scatter to the other side of the pond. I'm like, well, that's weird. Happened another day. Finally, he stays up and just watches it. Like, is there some cat? Like, what's going on? A blue heron each night would come to the pond and ravage it. And that blue terrorist was taking his fish. And so he put out a net to keep the bird away. It worked. And yet the next day he goes out, and the, when he walked up with the bread, they still scattered. And he's calling to them, and it's just it's not working. These fish are terrified. And he's like, what, what if I could just become a fish? Go into the pond and talk to them and tell them that they were safe. Wouldn't that work? That's exactly what Jesus did. He came to this world because he knew that he had to tell the truth. And he walked among God's people. And he told them that they were slaves. The Jews were slaves. Their heritage was fantastic, but that doesn't make you a spiritual son of the, of the Father. 
Jesus goes on, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Christian, Jew, I don't care what your nationality is, if you believe that Jesus is your Savior, you have a place in God's family, and that gold ring on the outside of Luther's seal is your future. It's beautiful to consider. <coughs> Luther told the people some 500 years ago that guilty consciences are now free. Slaves to sin, yes. And yet the truth is that if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You can't do this alone on your own. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This wasn't a righteousness that you lather up inside of you by digging deep. This is a righteousness that comes to you from Jesus through faith. Sola fide, sola gratia, sola scriptura. By faith alone, by grace alone, by scripture alone. Those are the truths of the Reformation, and that is the freedom that you enjoy. You already heard it. I said at the beginning of the service, I don't know exactly the wording, by nature of my call in office, I pronounce to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. Every worship service, we start by saying that. How else can I start and talk to a group of sinners who've come into the same room? We have to unburden ourselves. You have to hear that absolution. It's a beautiful truth. Aaliyah Simorel, eight weeks ago, was the last person I baptized. She had her sins washed away. It was a baptism forgiveness for the forgiveness of sins her conscience is clean as is every one of you who's been baptized it's fantastic and in just a few moments if you're a member of our church you get to come forward to receive jesus body and blood you can taste and see how good your god is real freedom if the sun sets you free you will be free indeed now, does that mean you get to do anything you want? No. You're not a slave to your wants anymore. You have a different heart. God makes the unwilling heart willing. That's the big change. You're not a slave to the cookies. You don't have to eat one. You can walk right past that cookie jar and not eat one. Because you know that is the will of your God. And you wake up every morning and you think, how can I serve my Lord? You have a purpose in life. You don't wander around aimlessly, why am I here? It's not just to eat cookies, my friend. It's to glorify your God. So you can confidently go up like the koi and take bread from your master's hand. And you can know that that truth will never be taken away. Martin Luther wasn't the first one to have discovered the gospel. He was the first one to have lived after saying it. There were a few other confessors, Savannarola, Hus. L Luther was called a Hus, and we all know how that, how that ended with being burned at the stake. But Luther didn't care because after he was free, nothing could take away that freedom. He didn't care. He stood before a court when he was pretty confident he was going to be killed. He said, unless you can prove from the Bible that I have made wrong statements, I cannot and will not take back anything. My conscience is bound by the word of God. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. In a world that has difficulty believing in the one true God, but is so ready to believe that our universe happened by some unknown accident, what do you